Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Delaware United Methodist Church uh, this uh, Labor Day weekend. It's very good to be back in worship with you after a week off of um, recovering from COVID. And, uh, sorry that we weren't able to be here in person, but glad that there were some folks uh, willing to set up a projector and do things uh, that allow there to be some kind of message and get that on the Facebook page. So. Um, we, we keep moving through the way we can, and, uh, but I did have a negative COVID test on Friday and uh, feeling much better, so uh, things are good. And uh, I know there's some other folks out there who've been infected as well, and it's still moving around, so just a reminder that um, I think especially one of the things that I learned out of it, if you're planning on going to an event where there's going to be other people, it's not a bad idea to test beforehand uh, to make sure that you're not going to be one of the carriers. So. Um, I think that would be the, one of the big recommendations that I kind of took away from it. Um, and also, uh, I think we picked it up at a concert at SPAC, so it was a lot of people in a big event, and it's the kind of thing that still will happen out there, so be careful. Call your attention to the announcements that are there in the bulletin. Uh, just a note, because tomorrow's a uh, Labor Day holiday, the church office will be closed. Uh, we'll be back in, ready to go on Tuesday. Um, there is coffee hour today, Joanne, I think. Yep. So. Uh, uh, opportunity to gather uh, for those hearty souls who are here this morning and uh, also just uh, I want to mention uh, watch for information and spread the word about restarting Sunday school on uh, October 2nd we're going to have a big kickoff event and things like that and, and get Sunday school back going in October so uh, you know invite a friend uh, especially if you have a neighbor with kids uh, somebody you know um, let them know that uh, we're getting back up and going Hope that they'll come and join us. And the rest of the announcements are there for you to look at. So now let us quiet our hearts and minds for worship. to worship. Those who want to save their lives, have good health insurance, pay their bills on time, exercise and eat right. Those who want to save their lives will lose them. Those who lose their lives in pursuit of God, who abandon the world's values, who live generously and faithfully, who listen to a voice beyond, 
Those who lose their lives in pursuit of God will find life. May we learn the value of loss. May we know the value of life. Please join us to sing hymn 553 in your hard copy hymn. making of clay was spoiled in the pot. 
potter's hands. And he reworked it into another vessel as seemed good to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me. Can I not do with you, O house of Israel, just as the potter has done, says the Lord? Just like the clay in the potter's hands, so are you in my hands, O house of Israel. At one moment I may declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that it will pluck up and break down and destroy it. But if that nation, concerning which I have sp spoken, turns from its evil, I will change my mind about the disaster that I intended to bring on it. And at another moment, I may declare concerning a nation or kingdom that I will build and plant it. But if it does evil to my sight, not listening to my voice, then it will change my mind about the good that I had intended to do to it. Now, therefore, say to the people of Judea and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, Thus says the Lord, Look, I am a potter shaping evil against you and diversing a plan against you. Turn now, all of you, from your evil ways and amend your ways and your doing. I invite the children to come forward and join us for some time of love together. Mm -hmm. no children Broccoli, you like broccoli? 
Yeah, see, you always say, oh, I hate rock. I like to no. Right? Sometimes you say, oh, I hate rock. Yeah, I like that as well. Right? Is there anything you don't like like that? Yeah. You don't like spicy? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I bet that's interesting as <laughs> great. <laughs> yeah, so we don't like spicy. Yeah, my youngest Jaden used to like spicy. When they were really little, he said, No spicy, no spicy. So, yeah, so yeah, no, no spicy. But yeah, she's so like, Oh, I don't like that. Sometimes people, we really, we really don't like it. We say, oh, I hate that. Oh, I hate that. Or sometimes you might think there's things that other people do that we really don't like, right? Ever have that happen? There's something that somebody does like all the time. You think, oh, I hate that, right? Right? <laughs> Anything like that? You have brothers, your brothers ever kind of like bother you? They never bother you, right? <laughs> no, you never eat that. No. So, so sometimes just things like that. So sometimes we use that word, that word hate, and um, sometimes we have to think really hard about not doing that because sometimes we get really angry. Right? And we mix up angry and hate. Right? Because hate is really the opposite of love. Okay? So we really need to be careful when we use that word. So sometimes what we mean is, I don't like that. I have a really strong opinion about not liking that. I don't like that at all. Right? I'm not going to eat that. Or I'm not going to go there. Or I'm not going to play with that person because I don't like the way they play. They don't get along with other people. But if we say, I hate them, or I hate that thing, that's a really strong word, right? Because it, it's really hate, ultimately, the opposite of love. And sometimes when we get angry, we even might say to a person, oh, I hate you. Sometimes we have such strong emotions that we say, oh, I hate you. When what we really mean is, I don't like it when you do that. Like, I really don't like it when you do that, right? Or I really don't like something about you. Right? Or especially something else in the world. So we have to be really careful because sometimes we mix up being angry, and being angry is just a real honest emotion about things, right? Sometimes things happen that make us angry, and that's okay. Jesus got angry sometimes. You know, there's a story about Jesus walking into the temple, and there were people there that were doing business in the temple, and he was upset and angry that they weren't focused on worshiping God. And some of them were actually cheating other people. So he walked in. And he walked right up to the place where there were people that were money changers, and he flipped over their table, right? So he was angry. So even Jesus got angry sometimes. It's really, that's, that's an honest thing as, as people that we do. But we have to be really careful about using words like hate, okay? And not saying that we hate somebody when we're really just angry, right? All right? Got it? Cool. So school started. School starting this week for you guys? Yeah? Remind me, fifth grade? Cool. And first grade? Is that right? <laughs> you don't know? <laughs> Not that least? First grade? <laughs> 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 the quiet day today? Okay. So first grade and fifth grade, preschool? Preschool? Yeah. You looking forward to it? So it's a great chance to make new friends and to learn new things. So I'm going to be praying for you guys this week that you have a really good first week of school. Because um, uh, two of my kids actually had their first week of school last week. So Jay got to start college, his second year of college, and Sam started graduate school. <laughs> you know what graduate school is? That's after college. Graduate and go to a new school. Yeah. So that's exactly right. So Sam started seminary. So he's taking classes there, and um, so everybody's got new stuff. So I'll be praying for you guys this week, and for all the teachers and all the people at school starting this week, because school's gotten really rough out there, and teachers are under a lot of stress, and students are under a lot of stress, and we all missed a lot of school, and it's gotten really hard. So um, work hard, and be nice to your teachers, and give them a break, and help them out, and remind your parents that teachers are doing their best. Right? Yeah. All right. We have a prayer before you guys go back to your seats. Okay? Let's pray. Wonderful God, we thank you for making us people with emotions. Remind us that we have to be careful about using the word hate when we're angry. 
remind us that we need to love each other and care for each other and be gentle with each other. We pray for teachers and students who are going back to school, that you will guide them and be with them and keep them safe. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Thanks so much for coming up. starting in verse 25. Will you rise as you are able to hear the gospel? Large crowds were traveling with Jesus. Turning to them, he said, Whoever comes to me and doesn't hate father and mother, spouse and children, and brothers and sisters, yes, even one's own life cannot be my disciple. Whoever doesn't carry their own cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. If one of you wanted to build a tower, wouldn't you first sit down and calculate the cost to determine whether you have enough money to complete it? Otherwise, when you've laid the foundation but couldn't finish the tower, all who see it will begin to belittle you. They will say, here's the person who began construction and couldn't complete it. Or what king would go to war against another king without first sitting down to consider whether his 10,000 soldiers could go up against the 20,000 coming against him? And if he didn't think he could win, he would send a representative to discuss terms of peace while his enemy was still a long way off. In the same way, none of you who are unwilling to give up all of your possessions can be my disciple. This is God's word for God's people. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. This word hate that shows up today is uh, one that I, I imagine for a lot of us um, trips us up, right? Whoever doesn't hate, you know, father or mother, siblings, family, uh, or even your own life, right? This word hate, because of the way we often use it um, to express anger or incredible frustration, to think about something that is almost the word that's translated hate here is a Greek word, um, missio. And missio does have that. It comes uh, from a root that basically means that sense of hate that we're used to. But the way it's used in this context in Scripture generally means to love less than. It means to love less than. So it's not that same sense of, of absence, although almost an absence of love, to not love or to love less than. So in other words, whoever doesn't love all of these things like family and possessions and your own life, less than you love God, less than you love Jesus, isn't really ready to be Jesus' disciple. That's what Jesus is saying here. Whoever doesn't love those things less than they love God, less than they love Jesus, isn't ready to choose 
God first isn't ready to be Jesus' disciple. That's still a hard word, right? The series I'm starting for this month of September uh, is, is called Having Words with Jesus, or words with, uh, Having Words with Jesus. It's this idea that Jesus comes with these things that he says, and over the next several weeks, first of all, one of the things you'll notice is that the next four Sundays, Jesus mentions money somehow. So if you're you know, thinking about what does Jesus spend a lot of time talking about, one of those things is money. So if you'll, if you'll look for the next four Sundays, the gospel lessons that are in the Revised Common Lectionary all have Jesus mentioning money. Something about counting the cost or about our possessions, all of the next four Sundays have to do with wealth or money or possessions. Okay. But also... Jesus says these incredibly challenging, basically sort of impossible things. If you're not ready to give up your own life, if you're not willing to let go of all of your possessions, which would include all of your wealth, if you're not willing to even walk away from your family, if that's what's needed, then basically what he says is, don't even bother starting. You're not ready to be my disciple. How many of us are really in that place? How many of us can honestly say that's the place we're in? So maybe we should just never mind. But I don't think that's what Jesus is saying. What he's doing, though, is putting an incredible challenge out there to us. Just this week, I uh, engaged in a back and forth on Facebook, which I should know better than to do. That was in relation to a statement that came out from our Council of Bishops, which called out the idolatry of firearms. Called out the idolatry of firearms. Now that's not to say that everyone who owns a gun is an idolater. Idolater. You might get that word out of it. But there are cases where what we do in things like weapons is put them on par with God. That's what idolatry is. Right? So when someone says, such as Wayne LaPierre, when he was the head of the National Rifle Association, the only thing that stops a good person with a gun is a bad person. No, the only thing that stops a bad person with a gun is a good person with a gun. Right? The only thing that stops a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. That's idolatry. That's idolatry. That's putting a firearm on par with God. Or even above God. My response to that is, no, I'm sorry, my God is bigger than that. So the Council of Bishops, probably 20 years too late, came out with this statement challenging the idolatry of firearms that too often exists, especially here in the United States. And in commenting on that, I ended up going to back and forth with someone who we talked about this idea of idolatry and about wealth became part of the conversation. And the things in life that we basically put on par with God because we think they will save us. I remember another thing that came out a couple of years ago from the General Board of Discipleship, from Discipleship Ministries of the United Methodist Church. When churches were struggling financially in the early days of the pandemic, and there was an article that came out online that said, PPP loans may save your church. And for those of you who remember Pat DuPont, who was associate pastor here for a time, Pat jumped on that fast and he said, oh, I'm sorry, I was under the impression that Jesus saves the church. <laughs> Thank you. We get caught up in this theology of scarcity. We get caught up in this idea that we need weapons or we need wealth or we need possessions, we need power, we need influence, we need something, when what we really only need is God. What we really only need to do is put our trust in following Jesus. To step out in faithfulness and courage and believe that that's all that we really need. Sometimes I love to sing some of the old hymns of the church because people love to sing those, especially those of us who grew up in the church and have been part of the church for 50, 60, 70, 80 years. Because we love those old hymns and our grandparents love those hymns. And then you look back at some of them and you think, think about hymns like, I surrender all. No, we don't. <laughs> We're lying. That's 
be real. No, we don't. All to Jesus I surrender. Take my silver and my gold, not a mite with I would hold. Baloney. <laughs> we don't. Let's be real. All to Jesus I wish I could surrender. Some to Jesus I surrender. But it's not a bad thing to put those challenges out there to be aspirational in our statements, because that's what Jesus is calling us to do. To put a goal ahead of us, to put something bold and courageous in front of us. This back and forth I had on Facebook, there was a person who basically accused me of being envious of those who have wealth. Because I think, like John Wesley thought, that if you have more than you need and your neighbor is going without, this is what John Wesley said, if you have more than you need and your neighbor is going without, you are stealing from your neighbor and you are stealing from God. That's what it means to be a Methodist. That's what it means to be a Methodist. That's who we are. That's what we're about. This Labor Day weekend should be actually one of our great weekends of Methodism because if you look at our social principles, and especially at the first Methodist social creed of 1908, it's all about labor. It's all about workers' rights. It's all about 40-hour weeks and ending child labor and safe working conditions and fair wages. That's what it means to be a Methodist. That's what it means to be part of this group that John Wesley called together and said, we're going to live out our Christian faith this way. Because he hears these words of Jesus who says, if you're not willing to walk away from everything you hold dear, if you're not willing to give up all of your possessions and your power and your wealth, if you're not ready to give up your own life, then you're really not ready to follow Jesus. I read those words and I think, you know what, I'm not ready to follow Jesus. I try, but that's hard, that's hard. But what we need to do as disciples of Jesus, as people of faith, as Methodists, is not simply say, well, that's not really what Jesus meant. We can't gloss over those words. We can't make excuses like I've heard way too many people do and say, well, Jesus is really just challenging those who are too attached to their possessions, like somehow he doesn't need us. I have an office full of cool stuff that belong to my grandparents, and I have my drums. Oh, man, I don't want to let go of my drums. I just got those. I love my drums. I have a guitar that I got way back when I was in college that I've taken through as a camp counselor and had a camp and played in church. And I love that guitar. I have baseball mitts that belong to my grandfathers that I have right there on a shelf so I can look over and see them because they remind me of my grandfathers and I love them dearly and they taught me to love baseball. I have all these other possessions that I've accumulated along the way and books on my bookshelf that belonged to other clergy, many of whom have passed away, but who were important mentors or colleagues in my life. I love that stuff. But I hear these words of Jesus and I have to wonder, do I love them more than I love him? Am I more attached to them than I am to God? So we have an opportunity as we launch into a new program here to really consider what's important, to look at all the things that we have and wonder how we can best make use of them and whether or not sometimes we're being called to let go of them. And by the way, you can always make donations to the thrift shop or the, uh, it's not this lab sale anymore, it's Blessed Barnes. Thank you. Amen. I was gonna go. And lots of people do. One of the cool things I love about Bethlehem is that Del Mar, the whole area here, is the number of stuff, that, good stuff that people put out by the curb so somebody else can have it. The, the trap with that is, I'm also really good at stopping and picking it up. <laughs> and they're like, yeah. I 
I want to say, too, that younger people are getting it more. And so we need to listen to them. My own kids look at ways that they can travel light, partly because they have the experience of moving a bunch of times, and they know what it's like to have to carry all that stuff and what a burden it can be, but they're very focused on having just what they need. Having just what they need, which is also very Western. And I hear that with more and more young people. When we have been moving, one of the things we've discovered is we put things that we decided we weren't going to move up for sale on Facebook Marketplace. And we found that there were young people moving from other parts of the country to where we were that had not brought most of their stuff with them. They had kept their clothes and other clothes personal items, and then they would get where they're going, and then they buy used stuff there. And then they sell it when they move, and then they go to the next place and buy somebody else's used stuff. What a great way not to be too attached to your possessions and to think of them as things that we have, that we use for a while. Are you ready to give up family and friends and wealth and position and power and status and even your own life? Then you're ready to follow Jesus. And if not, and like me, we all have to work to do. Amen. Our hymn of response is number 2137. Would I have answered when you call? That's in the faith we sing. We just rise as a great as we sing together.
One of the things that you'll find is that um, there's a thread of stewardship in pretty much everything I preach. It's not just something that we take on once a year. We have a season of some stewardship messages. We make a commitment to the church on a card and we turn it in. And we either, through electronic giving or by putting an envelope in the plate each week, do what we promise to do. But stewardship is really about a Christian way of living. It's about a way of discipleship. And so what you find is that there's a thread of stewardship in just about everything I preach. I don't want you to hear that as just trying to gain more money for the church so that we pad our coffers and have the resources we need, although there's a little bit of that, let's be honest. Guys, we like to have the lights on and pay the insurance and have staff to help lead us in ministries and do all of the other But it, stewardship is not just about giving money to the church. It's about seeing everything we have, everything that we're entrusted with, everything that we find ourselves in control of or in possession of as gods, and considering how best to use all of those resources. So as we prepare to receive tithes and offerings, it's not just about paying our dues to the church or supporting the church budget. But it's a time when we reconsider all of the things that we have in our life and how we can best use them to serve God. The ushers will assist us as we gather tithes and offerings. During the offertory, please join me in singing number 292 in the hymnal, What Wondrous Love Is This, number 292. Thank mm -hmm. you. to bear. But as we learn to follow you 
as we seek to be as generous as you, we discover that we can give others with hope, with grace, and with peace. Receive our offerings this day, so they might bless your children in every way imaginable. In this we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. As we enter into sharing prayers of the community, I invite you to join me each time in response for your bulletin. Circle us, Lord. Circle us with the light of your presence within this dark world. Enable us to be overcomers of fear and temptation. Enable us to be victors over sin and despair. Enable us to become that which you would desire. Lord of creation, Lord of salvation, circle us with the light of your Circle us, Lord. Circle our family within the shelter of your outstretched arms. Protect them in each moment of their daily lives. Protect them in the decisions that they face. Protect their homes and relationships. Lord of creation, Lord of salvation, circle our families with the light of your presence. Circle us, Lord. Circle this world with the joy of your salvation. Where there is sickness and disease, bring healing. Where there is hunger and despair, bring hope. Where there is torture and depression, bring release. Lord of creation, Lord of salvation, circle this world with the light of your presence. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is in your regular hymnal, number 400, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Will you rise as you are able as we sing together?
Please be seated. One of the realities of life is that we know that there comes a point when stuff is just a burden. Right? That's the practical aspect of what Jesus is often talking to us about. We worry about stock markets, and Jesus reminds us that God cares more about the poor than the doubt. We worry about our homes and making sure that they're well insured and we have all of these things that we need to maintain. And then we have the church building too and we wonder, well I wonder when they're going to come fix the air conditioning in the <laughs> office. A little stuff in there. And Jesus breaks through all of that and boldly proclaims that if you're not willing to give up everything, you're not ready to follow me. I'm not ready. But I'm willing to take a step. I imagine that most of you are ready. But you've still been walking that journey together with Jesus. We need to wake up each and every day. And say, here I am, God. Here I am, Lord. Send me, ready to try and do every day. We have, as we begin a new month, as we begin a new program year, as we step into the future together, an opportunity to say boldly to God, here we are. Where are we going? Go forth this day with courage. Go forth this day with Christ. Go 